This happened a good few years ago. I was in my early twenties, single and living by myself. Most of my family lived about a four hour drive away from me. I was working for a small call center that provided, amongst other things, phone service for a 24 hour plumbing company. So they needed someone on the line at all times. My shift ran from 8pm to whenever my boss showed up to pick up the line, which was usually 6am. I worked in a building that housed several businesses of the same sort, called center work mostly, though we were the only one that had 24 hour service. Because of budget cuts, I was always the only operator on my floor. The only people in the building at night were myself and the security guard who came by to do his rounds twice a night. Now because the line had to be on 24 seven, I was never allowed to disconnect while I was there. I ran to and from the bathroom, ate meals sitting in front of the computer, and every once in a while sneaked a cigarette at the window within sight of the screen. Only the light above my computer was on. Everything else was turned off when everyone went away at 10pm. So I was left in half darkness beneath the spotlight. I desperately needed that job to support myself. So despite the awful conditions, I kept repeating that it wasn't so bad. Things were usually quiet after 10pm. I could use the extra hours on my paycheck and didn't even need a second job. I did a lot of reading and even considered going back to school because if nothing else, the night shift would afford me plenty of time to study. So one night at around 2am or so I got a call. I introduced myself as I always did. Hi, you're speaking to so and so. My name is Jill. How may I be of service to you? The guy on the other side repeated my name and hung up. Working phone services on the night shift, you get used to a lot of weird stuff. So I shrugged it off and went back to my book. Then he called again and asked if he was speaking to Jill. I said yes, repeated the name of the company and asked how I may be of service. He hung up. The third time around he asks if this is Jill on the phone and I ask to whom I'm speaking. He hangs up again. The next time he calls he's breathing hard on the phone and tells me to talk to him and he's not gonna hurt me. I jot down his phone number and I start hanging up whenever his call pops up, which was for the better part of an hour. This went on for months. When he realized I was hanging up every single time I saw the number, he began calling from a restricted number, meaning I never knew if it was a legit call and ended up answering. All the time this guy kept saying he wanted me to talk to him and that he's not going to hurt me. The one time I counted, I hung up on this guy over 200 times in one night. Every time he would call, I'd say the company name and as soon as I heard him I would hung up. I complained to my boss and she did nothing. Instead she laughed off the whole thing because this guy obviously didn't know where I was and he was only a voice on a line and I was perfectly safe. Sometime into this I started talking to co-workers and here's where it started getting really creepy. He never called on my days off. When someone else would be covering my shift, indeed at one point I changed shifts with a co-worker to attend a wedding and he didn't call that day. As time went by I was getting pretty spooked by the whole situation and the fact my boss did zero to try and stop this. My co-workers were sympathetic and told me that if my boss did nothing, I should file a complaint myself. But I'm not sure I could since this wasn't happening on my personal number. None of them could really walk me home since I was the only operator in the night shift and everyone else was gone by the time my boss arrived and I left the office. I got a little paranoid because obviously this guy knew my schedule pretty well and even if I changed shifts. He would only call if he knew I was on the line. It had to be someone who could see me. 
I started commuting, with my cell phone in hand at all times, with the emergency number dialed in. Sometimes I did the whole commute on the phone with friends or relatives to keep calm. Since it's illegal to carry pepper spray here, at one point I considered walking around with a box cutter in my purse. That's how afraid I was. One day before my shift started, I was at the entrance of the building smoking a cigarette before going up and I see the security guard come by, the same fellow who usually did the night shift. This huge guy. I didn't really know him, I never spoke to him, I only said good morning or goodbye when I went by his desk, and whenever he came to my floor to do his rounds. I usually kept to myself, and never really made small talk or anything, I just greeted him out of politeness. He greeted me back. He asked me for a light, and I gave him my lighter, and he told me he had been fired, and he was going home, and he went on to tell me he always got the impression I was afraid of him, since I was never friendly or welcoming, and those were his exact words. He then told me he was never going to hurt me, and just walked away. I lost every drop of blood I had in me. I went inside to tell my boss the whole thing, and discovered the guy got fired for harassing women in other floors, going as far as to trying to corner someone in one of the elevators. The complaints piled up, and he lost his job. Most of the time his shifts matched mine, so he would see me come in at 8pm and left before I did. I asked my boss for that phone number again, to come forward on this guy and I asked the security company if it was his number. She told me she threw it away. When I told her the whole story, she found it quite cute. That's the exact word she used. Then she asked me if I was sure it was him, because a voice on the phone is different, and that perhaps I got it wrong. Those were her exact words again. Quality Assurance told us, and again, that our every call was recorded, so I demanded recordings. That's when I found out that, again because of budget cuts and whatnot, the night shift was never recorded, so I had no evidence. Once the guy was fired, the call stopped. I didn't work there for much longer after that. When I was a grad student, I was doing work with one of the university's wind tunnels, and since I was behind schedule, I was doing a lot of experimental runs late at night. One night, it's after 2am, and I've just finished a run with the wind tunnel, and I'm setting up another. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in the building. It's dead quiet, which is a relief, because when the wind tunnel is running, it's so noisy that you have to wear ear protection. Suddenly, I get hit by a sudden feeling of the willies. I can't explain it. One second, I'm entering running parameters into the computer, and the next second, my skin is crawling and my heart is pounding. The hairs on my arm are actually standing on end, and I feel certain, with no visual proof, that I am no longer alone. It occurs to me that while the wind tunnel is operating, anybody could slip into the lab without being noticed. The door is locked, but there are plenty of keys. I wander around the lab. It's big and full of large machinery with dark corners behind it, and I'm jumping at every dark shadow I see out of the corner of my eye. It's still dead quiet. The only noise is the gentle whir coming from the fan on the computer, and the sound of my footsteps on the concrete floor. I don't find anybody, but the feeling of being watched is worse than ever. I start shutting everything down, and by the time I'm done, my hands are shaking. Thank goodness the lab doors are self-locking, because I don't think I would have been able to work a key. I literally run out of the building. Schedule be damned. I never worked on the wind tunnels late at night. Again. I'm 36 now. But the following happened to me when I was 19. A quick bit of backstory. I worked as a volunteer firefighter in a small West Australian town in the southwest. 
In addition to the normal volunteer firefighter ins and outs of attending incidents, I was also involved in the sports side of the fire brigade. This comprised of the individual and team events and the fire brigade you belonged to was your team. And across Western Australia, there were about 30 such teams slash brigades. And between October to April, we would travel and compete. We had traveled to Geraldton to compete in the state championships in 1999. And I, through hard work, had won the champion fireman award and was at the hosting fire brigades after event celebration and was enjoying myself with my team drinking beer and socializing which started around 5 p.m. While I admit I was pretty drunk, I was still traveling well as there were a lot of people and a lot of my time was spent talking to officials, older members and with friends catching up. So I had not really got my drink on yet. I needed to go to the toilet. So I just went around the corner and began to urinate in the garden like I had a few times before. And being the same for every other guy at the party. And that was when I got a phone call from an unknown number. Being away from the noise, I answered it. And I remember the guy asking for someone. I didn't know them and ended the call after perhaps 10 to 15 seconds of Sorry, wrong number. I finished and then went straight back to the party. When I was returned, I was in absolute shock. Everyone had disappeared. It was dead quiet. Every table and chair was neatly stacked. All the rubbish cleared and the lights off and the doors locked. It was just dead quiet and not a sound could be heard across the town. I was very confused. I took my phone out and it was just after 4 a.m. What the hell happened? I checked through it and my phone showed literally dozens of missed calls and 30 to 40 messages of people searching for me and looking for me. I called my mate and made it back to my hotel and over the next few days confirmed with many people that I had been standing in a circle and excused myself to take a leak. And after I received the phone call, that was that. No one saw any of me that night. Where I urinated was where everyone was doing it. So it's impossible that I could have been there unnoticed and a group of friends searched for me around while I was gone. I still don't know what happened and I'm confused as hell. When I was a kid, this happened. I was very awake and nothing like it has ever happened since. People's general reactions tend to be that I must have had a night terror, but that simply is not the case. My brother had many experiences that confirmed to me that what I saw was real. I had just woken up from a dream, which I also remember very well. I was flying a plane through caves with Elmo. That's relevant because I woke up and at the time my brother and I were sharing a room. On one wall I had my twin bed, which was the top bunk of a bunk bed we had separated. Diagonally across from me, my brother's bed was the top bunk and it stood several feet off the ground, perhaps five. He used one of those plastic Fisher Price play sets to get up to it. Anyway, when I woke up, I was immediately aware of a nun dressed in a dark red version of what you would expect a nun to wear. I think it's called a habit. She was on her knees right next to my bed, just looking at me. I, of course, was very scared, but I could speak and move, and I even asked her where my mom was. I became really afraid when she was just looking at me. It wasn't a malevolent look. It was just eerie that she didn't react to my question. But what I next saw filled me with a type of horror that gives me chills just even thinking about it. On the slide set that led up to my brother's bed was an entirely black entity. It almost resembled a Dementor, but it wasn't floating nor moving, just standing looking down at my brother as he slept. As soon as I became aware of this thing, I was entirely consumed with dread. 
I remember being so terrified that I ducked under the covers until I actually made it to the morning. Some interesting things happened after this. First of all, whether this was a trick of the mind or not, I can't even say. But the next day at school was library day. The first thing I did was to get a non-fiction book on ghosts. And the first page I opened was to an artist's rendition of a nun, who I swear was identical to the one I had just seen. I mean, come on. But the scary part is that my brother had multiple experiences, which he complained about several years down the road. I doubt he even remembered my story. But at the time, he really started to get bad. Nightmares, night terrors, and seeing things in his room. He was in middle school, and it really started to take a toll on him in a lot of ways. I was in my junior year of high school when he finally told me what he had been seeing, as our relationship had been a little bit disconnected growing up. But we are extremely close now for those of you who are concerned. He told me that he had been haunted, or at the very least had several experiences with an all black entity that he described as entirely malevolent and horrifyingly evil. The chills I got then, I have them just now while recounting this. The kind of energy this thing had was so real and it made me believe in manifestations beyond the realm of our normal consciousness. There's a lot of backstory with my brother actually. He's always been attuned to things beyond normal perception. But this is the only thing that I have experienced too. He has also seen the nun I saw, and he says that she's always passive in the few encounters he has had with her. The first thing happened when I was 18. My 14 year old sister and I walked into the kitchen after ballet class. We were home alone and talking about what to make for dinner. All of a sudden, we hear a little girl laughing. It sounded like it was coming from just out of sight in the hallway upstairs. We both stopped mid conversation and stared at the hallway. My sister, still staring at the hallway said, did you hear the laugh? I said yes, and she jumped into action, grabbing a large knife from the drawer. I rolled my eyes, but grabbed one as well and followed her upstairs. There was no one up there. No TVs were on and no windows were open. We've had no other experiences in our house to date. This is now the second story. A few years ago, I used to work at a rehab center. I did the graveyard shift and had to go do three bed checks per hour to make sure all the patients were in bed. This was a really cool rehab program where the kids lived with the parents while they were there. And these people worked on getting clean and being a better parent. The only thing I hated about the job was that the houses they lived in were super old and really creepy and I had to navigate my way through with just a flashlight. As a result, I left many lights that wouldn't disturb anyone on and spent more time than I should have in the well lit office. One of my last nights there, I was in the office with my feet up on the desk. The light from the living room lit up on the wall in front of the office. And just then I heard what sounded like children playing in the next room. As the sound moves closer to the office, I can see what looks like the shadow of a little girl in a dress being cast on the wall from the light of the living room. I can hear her humming and talking to herself. When kids are out of bed, I was supposed to take them back to their parents, wake the parents up and make them put them into bed. I heaved my feet on the desk and they made a loud slap as they hit the floor. I saw the shadow freeze and then scurry away. Now it took me probably five seconds to cross the office and get to the living room. And by the time I got there, it was empty. None of the toys had been disturbed. 
The only place this little girl could have gone from there was over a baby gate, down a short hall, and then down along a creaky flight of stairs. I quickly ran to the stairs and looked down. For good measure, I went and checked on all the kids in the house, and they were out. The next morning, one of the dads told me about the creepy paranormal stuff he'd seen in the house, and that I was lucky to have not seen one of those. I was glad I only had two night shifts left after that night. This third story actually happened this year, the day before Halloween. I had a friend in from out of town, and we decided to take him on a ghost tour in downtown Salt Lake City. I had been on another tour by the same company, and it had been educational and scary. They hand out dowsing rods and EMF detectors, load everyone up on a bus, and take you around to various alleged haunted locations, and tell you about the activity claims. In the middle of the downtown tour we took our friends on, we went to the Holiday Inn Express. Yes, our tour guide made the joke about the not creepy name as well. In the 70s, the wife of a cult leader after her husband's death took her seven children up to a balcony and encouraged them to jump. The ones who did not want to jump were thrown off. She jumped after they all fell. One girl survived, and I believe that she's still alive today. For the tour, we stood on the sidewalk where the children landed and looked up at the balcony. Now I get dizzy upon standing quite frequently, and we had been on and off the bus for a good five minutes before. And then I had this experience, standing there looking up. My heart broke for those children. All of a sudden I got the most extreme sense of vertigo, and my heart started pounding. I was terrified. I have never been that dizzy in my life. I almost had to sit on the sidewalk. For just a moment, I felt like I was falling. I could feel the wind on my face, just as I was about to sit down, and then it abruptly ended and I felt completely fine. The tour guide started leading us back to the bus. My boyfriend had been standing in the road behind me during this whole thing, and he said that EMF had all of a sudden started going crazy, and then it stopped. I didn't see it, but his description seemed to coincide with my experience. It did not feel like I was attacked by a malicious spirit. It felt like I connected with the spirit of a sweet scared little girl. I'd never lived in the best areas. My parents never had much money, and I was a single child, but we grew up fine. There was one place we lived in, that I affectionately called Roman Hill, as it was very close to an old Roman fort, and as it was high on the hill, me and my friends just called it so. So, one day, I'm getting back home from school. I arrive a lot earlier than my parents do, so it would be customary for me to open the door, let myself in, and start cooking myself some pasta or something while watching cartoons. The usual day. Today was probably going to be like every other day, or so I thought. I got to the apartment building, and used the key to open the main door. I checked the mail, and started walking through, preparing to go up the stairs, as our building wasn't fancy enough to have an elevator. I had to ascend six flights of stairs, as we lived on the third floor. On my way up, as normal, do I go past the first floor doors. One of these doors houses a small, scraggly, strange woman. She's the kind of lady that you'd see with pot in hand asking for money on the side of a road, or perhaps saying about the end of the world. She was a little nutty to say the least. She always told me that good things were going to happen to me, and gave me a smile and called me dearie. But to other people, she could be a right old loon. 
as I was ascending the stairs, do I hear her door start to open just as I'm approaching it. So I make sure to look behind me and wish her a good day as I make my way up. She rattles out of her door, closes and locks it, and I wish her a good day and offer her a friendly smile. This time she doesn't even acknowledge me. She just walks out of her house and goes down the stairs. I know that she's a bit off. So I ignore it, don't dwell on it too often, and go up the stairs. My routine is like any other day, and I don't think about this for a while. Perhaps three months later, the same thing happens again. I'm coming home from school, but this time she's on the stairs, coming down them very slowly, with this vacant look on her face. I say hello to her, but she completely ignores me. I haven't seen her since the last incident, and wonder if perhaps she's getting to the end of her life with her not responding and all. But simply carry on with my day and forget about it. Not two days later though, coming back from school, it being Friday and me being overjoyed for the weekend, the me and two of my friends, as they were sleeping over, notice a moving van in the car park. We go over and snoop around to see who's moving in. It's a young couple with a small child. Being teenage girls, we start a conversation and dote on their adorable little boy. The mother tells us that they're moving into an apartment on the first floor, and that it would be great to see us sometime, and asked if I'd ever looked after children before. We get into this whole conversation about babysitting, and basically, I say that I'd be happy to do a trial run with them in future. I let them know the house I live at and to give me a knock if they ever need my services. I walk up the stairs feeling very giddy and my friends are telling me how lucky I am that I'll be able to look after that cute little baby boy and potentially earn some pocket money, which to a 15 year old girl is a triple win. I get upstairs, me and my friends hang out and that's when my mum arrives home a few hours later. I tell her about my day and me and my friends excitedly tell her of the possibility of work, about the people moving in. She tells me that that's absolutely fantastic, but then makes an offhand comment about how sad it was that our neighbour passed away. I ask her which neighbour and she tells me it was the lady, the lady who not two days ago didn't say anything to me. I ask her. When was this? She told me the following. The lady who had been living there had been a friend of the man who owned the block. However, she had not paid rent in several months, hadn't answered any of her post, and the stack of mail was just growing bigger and bigger, to the point it would no longer fit in her post box. So, the on site manager got in contact with the police. He opened the door up for them and they went inside. They found the decayed body of the neighbour. She had been dead for nearly four months, they estimated. They had to completely gut the apartment. And when it was fully finished, was it ready for new people to move in? I.e. the people who I'd met downstairs. I gave her a scoff and told her that it was absolute nonsense, as not only had I seen her three months ago, but that I saw her two days ago going down the stairs. I said this with such confidence, with almost a mocking tone in my voice, trying to bravado myself to impress my friends. But my mother gave me a concerned look. Honestly, darling, She's been dead for quite a while. I'm surprised you didn't smell it when you went downstairs when they were gutting the place. The thing is, I don't remember them gutting the place at all. Surely I would have seen it. Am I right? The family moved in and they were nice. 
I never saw the lady again, whether it was her ghost or something else. But I'm glad, and I hope, that whatever realm or plane she's in now, she's in a better and more comfortable place. This happened a few months ago. My wife and I went to the pool in our apartment complex for an evening swim, and there was a child with his mum there. Nobody else was there or in the pool. Now this kid seemed like he was a bit off, autistic perhaps, but what was strange is when he was near us in the pool, he gave off strange vibes. So there we were in the deep end, and this kid is on a styrofoam boogie board floating around us in the same area, making weird noises and staring at us. So we decide to head to the shallow end. I swam underwater for a bit and popped up when I could touch the bottom. But what happened next is something I have never experienced. When I came up, I looked around for my wife and she was nowhere to be found. The kid was still at the deep end floating around, and there was nobody but he and I in the pool. The kid's mum was outside the pool though. The pool lights were on, and I could clearly see the whole pool, but she wasn't there. I swear for a good 10 to 15 seconds I was looking all over the place, and suddenly behind me, she was there again, instantly. She said to me, I couldn't find you, I thought you got out or something. So for a brief moment in time, we couldn't see each other, and neither of us had gotten out of the pool. But we were both in the shallow end, somehow. While the creepy autistic kid liked to float around in the deep end of the pool, it's not like we were back to back or anything. We would have bumped into each other, or heard each other's movements in the water. Not to mention the fact that I spun around a few times looking for her. Honestly, we still can't figure it out. This happened so many years ago. I was in third or fourth grade in the early 1980s. I lived in a very rural area, with many small towns surrounded by woods. On this day, I was so excited to have permission from my parents to go directly home from school with a friend on her bus. Side note, my parents both worked long hours, unlike so many of my friends that had stay at home mums at the time. I was normally a latchkey kid, so anyway, I was going to go home with my friend on her bus for the first time. I even had a nice note from my mum about my trip home with my friend to hand to the bus driver after we got to the bus. I was super excited because my friend really lived in the woods. I had gone to her birthday party over summer, and we had collected fireflies and slept in an actual tent. This was so cool to me, because I lived close to the town centre, and didn't even own a tent. So here we were on her bus. We sat in the middle at first and then slowly moved up towards the front of the bus as kids got off. My friend lived just before the town line on a road that headed out of town, so hers was the final stop. Towards the end of the ride, we were right up in front behind the driver, who played some awesome tunes via the popular radio station WAAF. My friend, who was a bit of an odd little duck, was bopping to the beat of the song on the radio while I was just looking out of the front window of the bus directly behind the driver. Just then the driver turned his head to me and said, Hey, what would you girls do if I didn't drop you off? I was instantly spooked and looked towards my friend, who was still bopping away to the song. What? I stammered. I was not used to talking to adults I didn't know, but I knew what I heard. Oh, nothing he replied. He was just pulling up to my friend stop and pulled over and let us out. I have thought about this many times over the years, wondering why he would have said that. Then I wonder what if my friend's mum wasn't home? Would he have stopped or driven us to the middle of nowhere? Also, 
Since this was her everyday bus, why wasn't that creep a worry for my friend? I have since gone to grow up and raise kids in the same area, but can't help but think about why that driver picked that day to get all weird. I never told any adults, as I was a kid, and after we got off the bus it was no longer a concern. But yeah, creepy bus driver, please, let's not meet again. I was at Huntington Beach, doing a celebration banquet for the school's band. And as the night was coming to a close, some band kids noticed that some people were circulating a bonfire. Me and my buddy were going to try and join them because we thought they were joking. But then someone about 10 to 20 feet away began to start hitting a bell. And everyone that was circulating the bonfire started walking towards it. Just wait it gets creepier. We suddenly notice that there are candles in the sand, about 10 to 15. People get in a circle and some of them start to remove their clothing. At this point, I really had to take a leak. So I'm walking to the bathroom at the beach and in the distance, I can hear all of the people potentially doing a ritual start screaming out loud. This was creeping me out. I go back to where the band group was and everyone was packing up everything. It was around 9.30 or 10, almost beach closing time. And as I return, some people in the candle circle are walking on all fours while some people are standing and doing a tea pose. While they're saying some things that are simply indecipherable to me. And then they proceed to all strip to their underwear and run into the ocean. When I was 18, my mother kicked me out the house after she caught me drinking. I moved in with my estranged father, who lived in a 200 year old house on the coast of Western Michigan. In the kitchen was a door to the basement, where he had a studio that he spent most of his time in. He's a painter. And from the living room, you could see around the archway and most of the kitchen. Anyway, I was sitting on the couch reading and listening to the radio when the DJ announced the date, July 2nd, the day before my grandmother's birthday. I looked up and saw my father in the kitchen wearing an old red and blue pistons hat and matching windbreaker and pants, an outfit that I hadn't seen him in in ages. I called him and asked him if he had any plans for grandma's birthday because we hadn't discussed it yet. He had a stunned look on his face and seemingly backed up and disappeared. His reaction was a bit bizarre, but I wrote it off immediately. As he smokes a lot of green and sometimes acts strange or avoids me when he's a bit too into it. I got off the couch in an attempt to follow him, but when I made it to the kitchen, he was gone. The basement door was shut and locked but I hadn't heard the door close. A few hours pass and he comes back upstairs to make himself some dinner. I was a little ticked that he ignored me and being young, I rushed into the kitchen for scolding him for being rude earlier. I asked him why he wouldn't answer me when I asked him about grandma's birthday and told him that she should be more important to him and him not responding made me very upset. He looked confused and told me he hadn't come home all day, that he just got back and came in through the outside door to the basement to carry some art supplies before coming up and making dinner. I was about to call him a liar when I noticed his outfit was completely different. A ratty old white t-shirt, black sweatpants and a black baseball cap. I asked him why he changed his clothes. A little freaked out, but he told me he hadn't. I described what he was wearing when I saw him earlier, and he said that he threw the windbreaker and pants out about 10 years ago. It was his favorite outfit back in the day, and showed me what was left of the hat I was describing. It was practically falling apart in a drawer in his bedroom, which of course meant whatever it was I saw earlier was not my father. 
I must have had hundreds of spooky stories from living in that house. But this one really sticks with me. Being only four years old, I showered with my mum's help. Since I was little, I've had a very wild imagination, as everyone put it. One day, my mother was starting a shower, but I refused to get anywhere near the bathroom. She told me that she found my actions against her very unusual, since I was very well behaved as a child, and never spoke out against my parents or gave them a hard time. However, no matter what she did, she could not get me to step foot in the bathroom whatsoever. Her bathroom was located in the back of her bedroom, and you had to pass her bed before you got into the bathroom. I sat at the furthest point on the bed from the bathroom, crying, trying to tell my mother that I didn't want to shower. Normally, this would be a regular temper tantrum, but since I wasn't the typical child, my mother was frightened. So she got to my level and tried talking to me and asked me why I didn't want to go into the bathroom. She then thought about a recent experience my father had in the bathroom, which scared him so much, he said he would never step foot in there again. She then proceeded to ask me if I felt like something was in there, to which I nodded. I agreed to go into the bathroom and show her if she were holding me, and to not let me down. We proceeded to go into the bathroom and she asked, Okay, what's bothering you in here? What do you see? I led her to the shower and pointed at one of the small brown tiles that made up our shower wall. She freaked out. Apparently about a week before this, my dad was showering and he screamed for my mother. He pointed at the same brown tile and told her that there was something evil in it. He then declared that he would never step foot into that bathroom again, and did stay true to his word all eight years that we remained in the house. I never did get my shower that day. But cut to about four months later, my parents held a little house party with a few co-workers and friends. All bathrooms were occupied, and my mother's friend Lily really needed to go. She trusted her, so she sent her to her own bedroom. A few minutes pass, and Lily returns very shaken up. She shows my mum a photo she just took of the shower wall. This was when smartphones were newer and had only just started to come out. The picture was of poor quality, but her friend zoomed into the same tile. My mum's friend then chose to leave. Years after, my mum then decided to share this story with me and how badly it scared her. My father is very religious, so this story scared him as well, and doesn't like it when anyone brings it up. He never mentioned or talked about it ever again. About a year before we moved, my mother told me this story, and took me to the bathroom to see if I could still point it out. I took a long look, and pointed to the third row, ninth tile. It was the correct tile. My mother just got a glare in her eye and walked out the bathroom. Every time I walked into the bathroom, I got uneasy and wanted to get the hell out of there. I still question as to what the hell freaked everyone out in that tile, and I still get chills thinking about it. I am a 20 year old female doing my first semester of college. I was working at a well-known grocery store that rhymes with hogger. I had really late hours to match my school schedule, and mostly worked 5pm to 1am. I actually really enjoy night shifts, as the overnight team of mostly guys were very sweet and protective. One night, two men came in about 30 minutes apart from each other right before closing. They both gave me really weird compliments about my hair, skin, and body, and were just generally creepy. It's not uncommon. And I didn't think much of it, just a smile and wave. We
We close at 1am and it normally takes me a few minutes to close up. I grab my things, call an Uber and wait in the lobby right inside the locked doors playing on my phone until I hear an intense knocking on the window. These two men are standing right in front of me, waving their arms and begging me to come outside. Not knowing what to do, but not about to be dumbass and get taken, I tell them one sec and run back inside and tell the overnight guys what's happening. They're furious, and they're all quite intimidating. So I walk back to the lobby with them to get my Uber, and these guys outside glare at me before running away. What losers, waiting outside my job at 1.30am, but still, let's not meet again. I live in a condominium, and we own two apartments on the 7th and 8th floor. The only way to move in between them is to step out of the apartment, take the elevator or the staircase, and enter the other one. One night, we ran out of ice cream upstairs, and my mum told me to go get some from the downstairs freezer. So we took the keys to the seventh floor apartment, and since it was dinner time, there was no one there. I walked in the pitch dark and realised someone was sitting on the sofa. So I flipped the switch to see my dad sitting there. It was kind of weird, but I just went to get the ice cream and asked if he had a key to lock up. No answer. I shrugged and thought, well, if he came in and locked the door behind him, he must have one. I went back upstairs and my dad was sitting there eating dinner. I freaked out and asked him how the hell he got up here so fast. And everyone gave me a strange look and told me that he had been here the entire time. I told them it wasn't possible because I had just seen him downstairs and no one believed me. I will now never go back down there alone. Just to make everything quite clear, each of our apartment doors are fitted with three types of locks. There's a gate which has its own keyhole and lock. We put another lock in it so that you have to unlock this gate twice. And then there's a door and its own lock. So you need three keys just to enter our house if no one is inside. I did get a good look and it was 100% my father. He's kind of fat and has a serious looking face, so it's hard to mistake him. The apartments are not accessible because not only are they not on the same floor, they aren't even located on top of each other. There's an elevator in between them and they are on different floors. So there's no way for anyone to go up or down without first meeting at the elevator or the staircase. This happened when I was in first grade. Based on the people involved, it had to have been. But just know I was very young, but old enough to be in school. After school, I had to take the bus as we lived a bit too far from me to get dropped off and picked up each day. I would usually get dropped off by the bus on a random street near a different school with a bunch of kids and my grandma would be there waiting. The street couldn't be seen from that school, however, and it was basically just a random street with no real landmarks around it. There were some houses, but they were behind walls, so they couldn't see this street. It was a great place to grab someone and not be seen. One day, my uncle had borrowed the car that was supposed to pick me up. I didn't know this at the time, so I was confused as to why my grandmother wasn't there. Since this was back in the day when little kids didn't have cell phones, I had no way to call her and to see what was going on. I was stuck there pacing back and forth since my uncle was late. All of the cars left except one, but I didn't pay it much attention. Even the kids that would walk home from the bus stop were gone at this point. Ten minutes later, a car pulls up. I still remember this car because for some reason, it had patches of cloth on it in random places, as if the owner were trying to make a quilted car. The ugliness of the car doesn't matter. I just thought it was odd. Anyway, an older lady gets out of the car 
and begins walking towards me, as I'm still pacing back and forth. I see her and stop, and then suddenly, I heard a voice behind me, asking that lady what she was doing. Without taking her eyes off me, the lady said, Oh, my daughter called me and told me my granddaughter was pacing back and forth on this street, and for me to come and pick her up. By the time the voice from behind me was next to me, I saw it was one of my mum's friends. She put her arm around me and told the lady that I was the only one there and that I was with her. The crazy lady glared at us for a second before storming off to her car and driving away quickly. Turns out the car was sitting there the whole time while my friend and her mum and she were watching to make sure I was picked up. She took me over to her car and called my grandma to ask if it was okay for her to take me home. If it hadn't been for her staying around to make sure I was collected, I would have been living a very different life right now. So, to the lady with the ugly car, let's not meet again. I have only shared this with a few people, and have not since told anyone. Until now. I came home from being out with friends of a family-owned franchise at the time, and they were always working. It was dark and about 7 to 8 p.m., and I walked into my bedroom. I was the only one on the first floor of a two-bedroom house, and most of the lights were off except for the front door outside light. I walked down my hallway, like any other day, and opened my bedroom door. That's when I heard it clear as day. Someone, or something, yelled my name. I was going by my nickname these years, and the only people who called me by my name were my family, and they were hours away in another town. It was like I heard someone screaming it at me, like it were angry, or that I were being punished. My bedroom was blacked out, and I couldn't see anything. I immediately turned my light on and grab a baseball bat and do a search of the entire house, turning on every light to confirm that I am home alone. I am home alone, and someone yelled my name right next to my face, screaming it into my left ear. To this day, I still harbor fear of dark rooms and don't enter without turning the light on as quickly as possible. I've been deployed twice to Afghanistan and have been in numerous firefights, but I am still afraid of the dark. 12 years ago, I lived across the street from a church and a few blocks away from a library. I lived in a townhome, right next door to a 72-year-old woman. I believe it's important to note a few things before I detail some of the concerns I have while living on Joshua Street. I now live on the other side of the country. Thankfully, Joshua Street is located somewhere in the high desert of California. I never had audio hallucinations leading up to the point where I moved there, nor did I ever hear anything out of the ordinary after I moved across the state. The 72-year-old woman I lived next to was a very sound mind and able-bodied. She never once showed even a moment of mental fogginess. She had lived around the area for a long time, was retired, and left her house often. Her name was Hannah. The library had no alterations made to the building, or any that were made public or immediately noticeable whilst I was living there, and I went past it every morning on my commute. The church in question was modern, with no church bells, not inside, not outside, no bell tower, no bell speakers, no clock tower, nothing. It was not a loud church. So anyway, on to the story. Joshua Street was a typical looking area for the dry, arid locale. We had no grass in our front yard, more like a cracked, sandy, clay-like turf, with Joshua trees and other desert shrubs and plants scattered around my area. The townhome was less than luxurious, 
but no matter how loud I played music or shows, or how loud my neighbours were, we could not hear each other, which was a plus. Hannah was a kind woman who I enjoyed talking to in the mornings, and sometimes came over to her home to have a tea and listen to her stories. A month into living at Joshua Street, I decided to move furniture around so that the couch was up against the wall that separated Hannah's townhouse from mine. Originally my bookshelves were there, and I wanted to watch TV from a different angle of the house. This wasn't an issue during late night, but during the day I noticed some strange sounds while sitting on the couch. I went to my bedroom on the other side of the room that shared the same back wall, and there was no sound. I looked over all the house for a source, and I eventually figured that it might be coming from the other side of the wall. Although Hannah is very quiet, I never received any noise complaints from her nor did she tell me that she could hear anything when I played my music loudly, as I asked her to be polite, because this woman was old but certainly not deaf. Eventually I figured I should put my ear to the wall behind the couch. Clearly I could hear what sounded like church bells ringing. Needless to say, it creeped me out. Now I'm not religious, I'm agnostic, so I didn't really know that much about churches. I thought it was strange that I could only hear the sound of bells from the wall, and not when I went outside to see if it came from the church. I shrugged it off, and decided to ask Hannah about it next morning. The next day, I asked Hannah if I could come inside for tea, and she was happy to have me over. I took note that her TV was no way near the wall that separated our homes, nor any other kind of audio or radio equipment. This is because her kitchen is a part of that wall. I told Hannah about the bells I heard through the wall, and she told me she had no idea where the sound would be coming from. I asked her if she was watching televangelists or wedding shows, or had an alarm clock or loud timer, although I didn't really believe that the sound I could have heard could have come from any of those things. This is when phones were not high tech and didn't really have the capability to make high definition sounds. She said that she didn't watch anything of the sort, nor did she have an alarm clock. She joked about after living so long, you just wake up around the same time every day. And she said something that bothered me. She said that there used to be an old church on the same lot, and that the land was smaller than the current one. The modern church is very large, you see and this old one had church bells, but she never heard any church bells since then. She informed me the church was rebuilt in the 90s, and she thought that maybe I was dozing off on the couch and had dreamt of the church across the street. I went along with it and returned home. The third night after hearing the bells, I decided I would go across the street to visit the church. At this point, I was pretty curious about it. Three nights in a row, and I found it would be at 6pm every day. Mind you, at the time I had no idea about the significance of the time. I would watch TV when I got home at around 6, and I would hear something faint, and put my ear up against the wall. Gong. And I would listen up until either it creeped me out, or it suddenly stopped. I visited the church at around 5.45, and stayed there until 6.30. I didn't really want to be a part of the service, so as much as I wanted to listen for anything that sounded like the bells at home. Of course, there was no such sounds, and after asking the staff there about the history of the church, they told me the same thing Hannah did, and they also said they never decided to implement speakers or bells into the new building. Over the weekends, I began to notice other sounds through the wall, including the familiar bell sound. The bell would sound around lunchtime too, and eventually, I figured out this bell would sound at 12pm as well. This is from my journal. The bells sound at 12 now. I wonder if there is any significance to this, or maybe I'm just going crazy. 12 and 6, and now I'm hearing creepy music box sounds. Maybe I should just tell someone about it. They'd probably think I'm mad. 
Back in 07, a lot more people were going to libraries to do mundane things that many people today just do on their phones in bed. I didn't own a personal computer, and the Razer flip phone had terrible internet capabilities that you had to pay extra for. So I went to my local library with my journal and decided to do some research there. I quickly found that the church bells are traditionally rung at 6am, 12pm and 6pm. At this point, I wanted nothing to do with the town I lived in. This happened when I was about 16 or 17 years old, back when I lived with my parents before I moved out to college, where I live happily now. I used to live outside the city, and had a part-time job at a big retail store downtown. In order to get there, I had to take a bus, which was about a 30 minute ride. I mostly worked night shifts, as I still went to school and could work from around 5pm to midnight, closing up the store and taking the very last bus back home. Like every night, after my shift, I would wait for the bus at the bus stop. This skinny Caucasian guy, 5 foot 9, around 30 years old, with thick framed glasses and a buzz cut, stood next to me, and he kept rubbing his hands, mentioning how cold it was. I nodded and smiled politely, not thinking too much of it. He kept repeating how the weather was changing, and after a while I stopped responding to it, figuring he was just talking to himself. The bus arrived and I got on. Taking a seat in the back, he took a seat just one row behind mine. During the first 10 minutes of the ride, he didn't really say anything. You know how it can be dark outside and the windows reflect and function as mirrors? He kept turning his head to the side, watching me through the reflection in the window. I thought it was kind of odd, but still didn't think too much of it. He got off one stop before me, and I went home and forgot all about it. A few weeks later, I worked another shift, and as usual, I waited for the bus at the bus stop. I got on the bus, and to my surprise, this dude was on the bus again, sitting in the exact same seat. I recognized him because he looked particular. His posture was off and the glasses stood out. As this was a Friday night, the bus was very full, and I had no choice but to sit one row behind him. He tapped me on the shoulder. Hey, you take the 11.48pm bus often? I think I've seen you before. I nodded. I work nearby. We had this small talk conversation where I told him some small details about my life and who I was. That was a mistake. This is where things started to get really weird. Over the next few weeks, he would be waiting at the very bus stop every single shift I worked, or be on that very bus. He could have had a very similar job at a similar time schedule. But what truly weirded me out was that he kept trying to talk to me. How was work? I told him it was fine and tried to sound a bit rude in order to make him back off. You're quite a looker, he said. Do you have a girlfriend? Boyfriend, perhaps? I told him it was none of his business and that I would prefer to be left alone. He was a stranger after all. He seemed insulted and didn't speak to me for the rest of the ride. I didn't see him for a month until he showed up at my workplace. He walked up to me and smiled, waved sort of childlike, and he asked me where he can find a certain product, and I tell him where it is. After my shift, I wait for my bus and get on. Edward, I hear behind me. How was work? How was work? It must have been quite busy during the holidays. I turn around and see the guy again. I'm sorry, how do you know my name? Your name tag, silly. This is where he starts to ask me all sorts of questions about my school, 
parents, which bus stop I get off at. I ignored him and got off my stop. Well, Edward, I'll see you next week, he said with his childlike grin. I got really freaked out by this guy at this point and told my girlfriend about him. She thought it was just a harmless gay crush he had on me, but I explained to her that this guy was making me feel very uncomfortable. He knew all sorts of personal information about me and seemed to have nothing better to do than to take the same bus ride every single night. She figured she could pick me up from work instead, but I declined as I was not going to let some stranger influence my life decisions and routines. Whenever I would get out of work, he would wait for me. It just seemed like he would. I told him to get lost after a few months. I graduated high school and quit my job to move to college. I still occasionally take that bus when I visit my parents, but I have only seen this guy once while doing so. He waved at me as if he had run into his old pal, and I ignored him. It might not be that scary to any of you, but this guy still freaks me out to this date. When I was 14, I was taking a 3D modeling class at my online school and had a teacher who I'll call John Doe. He was around 60 at the time. John Doe was a little friendly. He would always ask to Skype and would talk about subjects unrelated to school. If I had my audio on, he'd ask for me to turn on my video. He'd also ask me to lower my camera when I was wearing tank tops and whatnot. He'd say I was the most beautiful girl in Hawaii and would tell me how lovely I looked and be very complimentary. He sort of opened up to me in a way that's unusual for teachers to do so. He also always gave me A pluses, so I appreciated that. Never an imperfect score. My 14 year old self had never had someone open up in that way, so I went along with it. it. Kind of intrigued me. I don't mind because he always gave me perfect grades and was always flirting towards me. He'd look at my chest when we were Skyping and would constantly compliment my physical appearance. He'd say we should meet in person sometime and asked where I lived. He'd say he'd swing by even though it was far even if it were just to hang out, and that he would love to see me in person. But that never materialized. This complimentary behavior and Skyping carried on for months, until he randomly disappeared from school and Skype. I started searching his name, and found out that he had complimented on girls around my age's YouTube accounts with very similar jargon. I don't know what the reason was as to why he was dropped or reassigned from the school, all I know is that he was, and I never heard from him again. At that age, I didn't think anything was wrong with his behavior, but now I feel it's apparent it was a hint of inappropriate, and I'm glad that it didn't escalate or get any worse. I am a 27 year old male who, since I recall, there has always been paranormal stories about my house. The first one that I remember are from the family that lived in the house years ago before I was born, as my grandfather built the house. It started with one of my uncles. He said the voices were calling him at any time of day, calling his name, that there would be random cold spots in the house and that some days he would discover scratches all over his body, some of them with little bits of blood on them, and in places where he wouldn't be able to reach with his own hands. That phenomena continued for years until he went to a spiritualistic person. I don't know what to call it, but it's someone who deals with tarot, cleansing, and that kind of stuff. Let's just stick to spiritual person. He said that there was something attached to him. So he prepared his supplies 
He went with my uncle to the back of the house. He tried performing his ritual, but said that it wouldn't be much use from the outside, and that he needed to go in, since the entry was focusing on him. After a little while, my uncle ran off away from the house, and shortly after became a priest. He is currently still operating at his church, and talks about his experiences, and is now closer to God, and has done so in order to stop feeling followed and observed, and to stop hearing voices and feeling the scratches. My grandparents were always skeptical with him, but not my other uncles nor my mother. Another one of my uncles was sleeping on the couch, when something grabbed his foot, pulled him awake, and started to drag him through the living room. He told me that he was seeing a large foggy shadow with no legs, only from torso to head, with one extremity holding his foot. He began to scream for help, and that's when his brothers came running into the kitchen, turned the light on, and there was my uncle screaming on the floor. This happened just after my uncle left to become a priest, since he was one of the older ones. My mother is one of the youngest of the children. When she was a teenager, she invited friends to the house to have a sleepover, and when they were all sleeping, a strange sound awoke them. She said that the sound was like someone suffering, being choked, and it was the gagging sound they were making while pleading and gasping for air. She opened her eyes and says that she saw a shining woman enter the room from the wall, floating. She had no body movement. She was still white, floating, and displacing through the room. My mother covered her eyes, but with a little peek to notice how the woman was laying horizontally above one of her friends, doing the sound. After a while, the floating woman returned to a vertical position and left the room again through a wall. My mother couldn't resist the crying, and told her friends all about it. Another experience from my mother, is that one night she was laying in her bed sleeping, when all of a sudden, she awoke, but was completely paralyzed. Classic episode of sleep paralysis. She couldn't move, and all that she could see was the ceiling. She claims that there were three little winged figures flying in circles above her. She described these figures as little naked women who were whispering things, although she could not understand what they were saying. She started praying, and after a while the entities flew into a big mirror in her room. I was a little kid at the time, and I remember how that mirror was covered during some of this event. The stories that I have shared with you are considered true by the people involved. These are only a few experiences that convinced them that there was something in that house, and I believe them. It appeared that the thing that was haunting my uncle started focusing its attention during my youth on me. I tried to explain the scratches on my body with normal things like I was cutting myself by accident, scratching myself with nails and stuff like that. But it didn't make any sense. It's not like there were any animals that could also harm me or do anything like that to me in the house. Then I realized it couldn't have been me, because the scratches started to appear from nowhere. I felt the pain, looked, and it was there, from nothing. It was an incredibly chilling time of my life. I live in a house with just my mum and my two sisters. We get on quite well. The house is fairly new and built in a decent area. So, onto the story. I was just chilling watching some cartoons and both my sisters were out. It was just me and my mum at home. My mom was probably working in the other room, as I could hear her furiously typing away on her laptop while having a conference call via her phone. I was just chilling and thought I'd get up and get a snack, 
as Mum hadn't even considered making dinner yet, and it was already getting late into the afternoon. Come to think of it, my sisters had probably gone out to eat somewhere. Anyway, I was just in the kitchen getting a snack, when my mum opens the front door with shopping in hand, and my two sisters right behind her. I look over at them, incredibly confused. I swear my mum was just in the other room. How the hell was she coming back with car keys in hand and groceries in another, and my sisters in tow? I give them a confused look and they walk straight past me and set the things down on the counter. And then, the creepiest thing of all. They were there, and then in a split second, like in a blink, it's all gone. The door is closed, the stuff they placed on the counter is gone, and there's no one here but me. I shout my mum's name and hear her reply, I'm on the phone! That was really weird, I thought. I run up to the door, and it's still locked. I go over to where my mum is, and she's still on the phone and giving me a confused and slightly annoyed tone. One that says, what do you want? Can't you see I'm busy? I collect myself, sit down on the sofa, and try to pretend that that never happened. I'd never told anyone before, because I thought for a few moments I was going insane. I never did have that snack. I'm a 23 year old female, but at the time I was working, I was turning 19. And for reference, this all takes place at my local gas station. I have a fairly young face and I'm very short to the point that I had to climb onto the checkout counter to stock cigarettes. It was not fun, and the customers loved to watch. So I've had many experiences, but this one takes the cake. There was this local dealer that came in a few times a night to get soda and food. The gas station I worked at specialized in fried chicken, and he always had a special order made by the cook, who I was good friends with. The dealer was called Baba. Most of my co-workers brought from him often, so oftentimes they would go behind the place to buy from him. I worked 4pm to midnight, and on my first night he came. He took a shine to me and began to flirt. Many people have taken my kindness as flirting. He was one of these people, and it got creepy pretty soon. He kept saying how he and I would have dates, and he'd tell me about this yellow dress he bought for me to wear on the date. One night, on my way out of clocking out, he approached me, which caught me off guard, and he kissed me on the cheek and then walked away laughing, leaving me standing there shocked and feeling violated. It freaked me out, but not enough for me to stop coming to work because I really enjoyed my job. Now, whenever I took breaks, I took them at this dark area next to the store that had a makeshift bench on it. It was quiet, and I liked it. Turns out one night when I didn't take my break because it got so busy, he was waiting for me there. Now one night he calls the store asking my supervisor to speak to me. She knew this guy was a creep and told him that I wasn't working. She hung up on him after a few moments and later told me what he said afterwards. Apparently he sounded very drunk and said, I could see her in the window. She isn't working. Put her on the damn phone. He was very angry for some reason, and she made sure to keep an eye out for him that night. Fast forward two days. I'm working my usual shift and it's around midnight. Our policy is that we have to close the store in order for it to roll into a new business day. A car pulls up in front of the store, and from where I was stationed, I could see outside the store into the parking lot. It was Bubba sitting in his car staring at me, with a very angry look on his face. He didn't exit the vehicle, he just sat there staring. He seemed to be playing with something whilst staring at me. Now in walks my friend, who was surprising me by picking me up that night. 
my one male friend who is super tall, said they walked past his car and happened to look over. Abba was playing with a big knife, and there was duct tape and rope sitting in the front seat. After that, I noped out of there and quit that job. We see him once in a while around town, but I'm always with friends. I'm just lucky he never learned my first name, and that I didn't walk home that night like I usually do. It was a pretty freaky experience that shattered my innocent view of the world. This happened when I was in 11th grade, and was 16. I knew it was messed up at the time, but it's been three years now, and I realise just how really messed up it was. I was friends with this boy since middle school. We'd known each other a while, and he was always a little strange. Kind of socially awkward, but who isn't in high school? He'd recently come out as pansexual, and told me he liked this boy that was gay, and wanted me to get him a date with said boy. Somehow I made this work, and they went on a few dates, but ultimately it didn't work out, and things were left a little bit weird between the two. He then told me he liked a girl who I was familiar with, and asked me to get him a date with her. Again, I made it work. This girl was also super strange, incredibly awkward, but had some underlying issues she was dealing with. They were a bad couple. Their first date, they went to a nearby waterfall that she wanted to climb down. She got stuck, and they had to call the police. Things were very intense for a short amount of time between them, before they ultimately cut it off, because she went to the hospital for trying to end her own life, as I'm not sure what led to that. I apologised to my guy friend, and he said that everything was fine. A few days later, he lets loose on someone's Facebook status, that he is going to shoot up my high school. He has a plan, posts blueprints of the school, and draws out where he's going to go first. He drags another student into it, who is known for being crazy and has anger issues, but is completely innocent in the story, and was horrified his name was dragged into it. He targets me specifically, calls me horrible names and threatens me, and says that all of this is my fault. Me and another student talk to him over the status, telling him to calm down, while other students egg him on. It was super scary because this wasn't something I ever thought would happen in my city, let alone my school. I take screenshots and email the principal, and our assistant principal. They take this super serious, and the police get involved that same weekend. Q questioning police presence on our campus for two weeks, and I and a few other students involved have to get restraining orders against my friends. He has a court date, and I'm not even allowed to go there or be a part of it, or even be updated about it, which I'm still a bit peeved off about. He was removed from our school, and I haven't seen or heard from him since. I'd be very glad to never meet him again. I've always grown up around people who've seen ghosts, and I believe in them, but I have personally never had an encounter except the night after my father passed away, when the ZAR 200 note went missing out my wallet. That was the last thing he gave to me, but I'm here to talk about something that just happened. About an hour ago, I was playing Sims and listening to creepy Reddit videos, which is what made me decide to share this immediately. Then I went to bed. The whole night, there was a wedding party going on nearby, and I could see the lights and cars and everything from my room. Loud music, great vibes, and it sounded like they were having a fantastic time. Then I get ready for bed, and go to the bathroom to take a whiz. Then I'm still hearing the jolly music. Then all of a sudden I hear a really low-pitched voice. Oh. That's the sound it made. And then the music stopped. I checked out the window and all the lights were off, all the cars were gone. And it was as if everything had come to a sudden halt and disappeared. To quote Keith David, I'm freaking the hell out inside, but I didn't tell anyone. 
I asked my neighbour about the party, and she gave me this confused look and asked, What party? I'm perfectly sane, and my mum commented on how loud the party was, so it definitely wasn't my mind playing tricks on me. What the hell was it? I was on my way to the choir performance I had in a town on the other side of the country. I had to catch the sound check session because if you're not there, you don't perform later. Rules of the choir. I'm running a little late, so I'm driving just a bit over the speed limit, around 80. But the road is almost completely empty, so I figured it was okay, even though it was raining quite heavily. When I was merging onto the highway, I overtook a car that kind of stuck out from the rest. It was a dark green rover, with a Bosnian license plate, which is very rare in my country, and a little sticker in the back that looked like a logo of a fight club or school. It's a very specific combination. I'm driving on the right lane when a dark green rover passes me. It caught my attention because I was driving pretty fast and I wanted to see who was in such a hurry to overtake me. As I was overtaking every other driver I encountered on my way so far. Okay, so the guy just caught up to me and passed me. I don't know why, but I remembered the last three numbers of his plate, and I still do. A couple of kilometers down the road, I see a pair of lights approaching in my rear mirror. So I move to the right again. When it passes, it was the same car, same plates, same sticker, same brand, and same colour. And then it happened two more times. The last time was a bit freaky. I saw someone beginning to pass me and I thought, Hello Rover, and there he was. Two of the times it happened on a stretch that had no stops or exits, so I don't know how it occurred and never once did I overtake him except at the beginning. But here comes the good part. I'm driving back from the concert. It's pretty late and the rain is pouring like hell, so visibility was bad. I was slowly driving home and this same car passes me twice. I tried to snap a picture, as I was now expecting it the second time, but the first time freaked me the hell out. But due to the rain and bad phone, it didn't add up very well. All in all, the same car passed me six times. I used to work at a hospital for the mentally ill. Although it was a hospital, it didn't look like a regular one. It was more homely but it still contained tough security systems, so patients couldn't go into any rooms without an electronic key. Only their bedrooms were accessible to them. Anyway, we had one patient in particular who would always shout randomly at the air and argue with it. We knew she hallucinated a lot and would jokingly ask her who she was talking to. She would always say that she was arguing with a couple, male and female, who lived upstairs. The only rooms upstairs were the staff room and some offices. One night, I was doing the night shift. It was late and I was cleaning the lounge when I noticed a shadowy figure move in the reflection. I wasn't scared though, as I just thought it must have been another staff member or even one of the patients who would come out of their bedroom. I immediately peeked down the long corridor, but it was completely empty. I thought I must have been tired and just imagined it, so I ignored it. Later that night, I was trying to have a quick nap, and I sat with the TV in front of me off, and I saw the shadowy figure walk by through the TV reflection. But this time I heard my name being whispered. I thought it was a staff member who had caught me trying to have a quick nap, but lo and behold the corridor was empty. I didn't bother telling anyone, as I felt they would clearly not believe my story. A few days later during a day shift, 
a bunch of us staff members were talking about the patient that hallucinates when one of the staff members spoke about an experience he had on the night shift. He described seeing a shadowy figure through the reflection of a glass door. The others laughed at him, but I told him that I had experienced it as well. We were both creeped out, as we knew that we clearly hadn't imagined it. Plus, this patient's story became more intriguing after another patient started complaining of a mysterious woman who she would see walking up and down at night and claimed to have lived upstairs. This happened many years ago. I don't remember it myself, but my mum told me about it and it really creeps me out. I was neither first, second or third grade when it happened. Anyway, I was a little kid. The school has their own blocks for different grades. First to third grade are in their own block called a B block. The rest of the blocks named C, D and E had their own theater slash drama studios in the basement. The a B block was in no way allowed in this studio, unless the older kids had a play going on. No adults would let us down there. With that being said, here's the story. I walked to school, and when I got there, a man I didn't know at all asked me for help in the basement. I have two older brothers who went to the same school, so I knew every teacher at the time, and they knew me. But I didn't know this guy, that gave me the first alert. The second alert was that he asked me for help. I was in the AB block. In other words, kids are the last people you'd ask for help. The third alert was that we were under no circumstances allowed in the basement when no play was going on. I ran to the nearest group of kids, my mum told the school, and the school did nothing about it. Nonetheless, that could have gone badly. I'm glad I was smart enough to not give him the time of day. I was hiking in the woods with my friends in Eastern Europe. I want to keep this place anonymous. It was four of us. We were going on a week long camping trip and really wanted to make the most of it, hike around the area and just have a great time the four boys. We went out there and on the first day picked a pretty nice spot to set up camp. We brought our fishing supplies and we're going to do some fishing one of these evenings. We were all very excited. There were booze and all the necessary junk food to ensure a great time. Now where we were camping wasn't too far from the car park and we could very easily drive into town when we needed more stuff. We intended to explore, but not go very far. Anyway, on to the story. The first few days were great. We were buzzed, having a great time, sharing stories, and generally just hanging out with friends and being in good company. It was on the third day that we decided to pack up our stuff and go further in. There was a nice watering hole where we could fish in the evening and see if we could get any good catches. So we thought we'd try our luck. We set up camp nearby and started fishing. At one point, we really wanted more junk food. And even though we'd moved campsite, it honestly wasn't that long of a walk back to the car park. I volunteered to go to the local supermarket, which should still be open, to pick up all the beers and junk food my friends wanted. I think it was about a 20 minute walk through the woods and then a 10 minute drive. So I would be gone at most an hour and 10, an hour and 20. It's not like the fish were biting very much anyway. So off I went. I got to my car and drove off into the town. Nothing eventful happened. I got to the shop, bought all the stuff and started making my way back. One tidbit that I do remember is that the security guard was at the store and he was frantically looking at his watch. It became very clear 
to me anyway, that the shop was almost closing, so I was quite fortunate I arrived when I did. 11.50. I left the store, and it closed pretty much straight away, and I parked up in the same spot I was in before not too long ago. I grabbed my bags and began walking in the dark to where my friends were. Now to me, with all this extra weight, I think the journey must have taken about 25 minutes, as I did have to stop and break every once in a while. But when I arrived to the fishing place where they were, they weren't there. I went round to the campsite, and only one of my friends, Johnny, was there. I asked very nonchalantly where the other two were, as I put down the bags on the dirt and started rummaging through to open a bag of Doritos. He gave me a fierce look, and asked me angrily what the hell I was doing, why I didn't answer my phone, and where the hell was I. I pulled out my phone and showed him. There were no missed calls. But at that moment, I noticed something incredibly odd. The time on my phone now read 4.40am. What? I looked at my phone and over to him and said out loud, what the hell? I explained to him that I was there just before the shop closed, drove back and walked the 25 minutes with the shopping to get back here. He yelled at me calling me a liar and we were having an argument about this. I told him I didn't know what to say, that that is honestly what happened, but that somewhere in between the drive, arriving and walking to the site, did I lose so much time. I genuinely am clueless as to what happened. My friends had even gone so far as to walk through the woods, call the police and start a proper hunt to see if I would show up. But there I was. My friends were informed, as were the police, that I had been found, and they came back pretty pissed as well. I did try explaining to them, and said that if we would go to the shop in the morning, that the security guard and footage would be able to prove what I did. Not to mention that the beers were still very cold when I put them down, further proof that they had been where I said they were. They opened the beers tentatively and realized that they were still quite cool, certainly not warming up for being in the warm climate and heating up for four hours. Everyone felt very uncomfortable. In the morning, we packed up our stuff and all went home and never spoke of it again. I still don't know what happened that night. Part of me really does wish to know the truth, but there's another part of me thinks that maybe this should just be forgotten. Maybe there's something sinister or strange at work, and I just got off lucky. In any case, I try not to think about it too much, because it always gives me the heebie-jeebies. So my mum recently rekindled the relationship from high school. His name was Mike. Mike started to sleep at our house, and had a lot of physical ailments, like diabetes, and they even thought he had cancer, due to some spot on his lungs and other organs. I was caring for him while my mum was at work, because he was basically paying a couple of our bills with his disability checks. He was 40, and when my mum saw him again, he was a mechanic and in perfect health. But since he was a kid, he had bouts where he stopped caring for himself and stopped taking his insulin, and suffered tremendously, of course. He was here for about a week. He would get in his car and drive around to try and help people with stuff, because I guess he felt like he needed to. He was a really nice guy. One morning I woke up, and my mum went to work, and Mike was out doing the usual. I'm sitting in the living room watching TV, and I hear walking coming from my mum's room. We have wooden floors, so if you step on them you can audibly hear it, and at first I thought it was my dog Susie. So, I go in there and can't find the dog, and I wasn't at all worried. 
I sit back down and I hear it again. I'd ignore it for a good minute. But I turn around and my dog has been sitting on the sofa the entire time. I go in the kitchen and grab one of the butcher knives. And I head in there real slow, but not quietly, in case it is an intruder, so that they freak out and run away. I lock on the ground next to my mum's bed, and Michael's meds and my mum's stuff are on her shelf. They've all been tipped over. Picture frames, dolls, her bible, all nowhere to be found. The shelf, for context, was my late grandfather's. He had given that to my mum before he passed. And so I tell my mum, and she obviously thinks I'm crazy. But Mike bursts in and tells me that since he was a kid, he's had something following him around. A few weeks pass, and I'm in my living room after everyone had gone to bed, maybe at about 11 or 12. Somewhere between there, I get up off the couch and go to the restroom. I had just finished my business and began washing my hands. The water is running, but as soon as I turned it off, I could hear chairs shifting in the kitchen. I go to the kitchen, which is next to the living room, and they've all been flipped upside down. I don't believe in ghosts or demons or anything like that, but I was walking to my bedroom faster than I had in years where I had a Bible that someone had given me once, and I just grabbed that thing and held onto it, fearing for my life at that point. The very next day, my mum's boyfriend went off to do the usual, and never came back. We don't believe he's passed, simply disappeared. My mother was obviously upset. She took his things to his mother's house and dropped it off, and that was it. Before that, I had this unwavering belief that ghosts and demons just weren't real, and everything was explainable. But I can't begin to explain what that was, or how that stuff happened. I just know it wasn't my grandpa saying he was here, but something more. I worked at Waffle House on the night shift for almost two years. And this guy came in one night when they had me at a different store location than usual. He sat in my section, so of course I set him up and tried to be friendly. He immediately began telling me that I was really hot. I was uncomfortable, but I had been spoken to more inappropriately before, so I just kind of brushed it off. He ordered his food and everything was fine for the most part, until the end of his meal. He went back to telling me that I was gorgeous. He asked me for my number, but I told him no thanks. And that did not go well with him. He started to really bug me. So I walked away and told another server to take care of him for the rest of the time. I even let them keep the tip. He was offended that I wouldn't come and speak to him. And when he got up to pay for his meal, he walked back up to me and started asking for my number more aggressively. I tried to walk away, but he kept following. One of the cooks spoke up and told him he'd have to leave if he kept it up. He lost it after that, began cursing and talking about how he could take really good care of me, talking about how great his thing was. At this point, I just walked to the back part of the store and stayed there until he left. One of the other servers apologized and said that he was actually a regular and they think that he's a pimp from across the street at this shady motel. A few hours had passed and I stepped out back to smoke. A few minutes later, he came walking around the back of the building, approaching me again. I immediately went back in and closed the door before he had a chance to say a word. He was literally just sitting in the parking lot waiting for me. I had to have a cook walk me to my car when my shift ended. Since that day, I have refused to work at that location ever again. We had a dog that was a bit too unruly to be kept inside. So he spent most of the summer on a lead, beside a large group of Forsythia up the hill that was our backyard. 
My brother and I were responsible for his food and water each day. And being brothers, it often became a race. It wasn't exactly fair for the one of us doing the water that day. But it was what it was, and occasionally ended with a full out sprint down to the steps by the house, with flying elbows and shoving that somehow never ended in disaster. One day it was my turn to do the water. I filled the jug and went up the steps, trudging up the walk to the dog's run. After emptying out the water, I began pouring into the fresh stuff and looked down the yard. My brother was about halfway up there with the food. I laughed and taunted him that there was no way he'd run the race today since I was almost done. He just shrugged and kept coming up and went around to the far side of the Forsythia. Well, that was odd, but whatever. I'd wait for him to come around and dump food and then start running. I liked the actual races. I finished with the water and scratched the dog's ears for a bit. I went in a bit deeper scratching and petting the happy pooch, but he never came around. He wasn't in the bushes, he never went back down to the house, and I eventually gave up on the joyful thought of sprinting down laughing at him while he poured the food in and sullenly marched down to the yard and inside. He was standing there in the kitchen talking to my mum. How do you get back down here? What? Didn't you get the dog's food? No, he's been here talking with me. Why? Ah, uh, no reason. I'm pretty sure I saw the ghostly doppelganger of my brother, though nothing bad happened outside getting freaked out by it. I was around six, and in Ireland, I would be in senior infants. I think first grade in America. I remember this day well, but some things are a bit blurry, as it did happen over 12 years ago. School had just finished for the day, and I was waiting for my parents to come and collect me. Both of them worked, so I was used to waiting for them. I was waiting for about 10 minutes outside the school gates, when out of nowhere this huge woman came up and grabbed me by the arm, insisting she was a friend of my mother's, and said something along the lines of, I know where your mother is. Being a dumb kid, I followed her, and she guided me to the church directly beside the school. Her car was in the parking lot of the church. She opened the car door and threw me in. That hurt. I was confused as to why my mother's friend would hurt me, and I knew something was wrong. She didn't get in the car, but she locked the door and waited outside it, looking around as if she were waiting for someone. I thought of all the stranger danger warnings I was taught as a child. I began to cry and try to open the door, but of course nothing happened. I remember looking down at my Winnie the Pooh backpack and my eyes being blurry with tears. Next thing I heard was arguing from outside the car, and I looked to my left. There was my best friend's mother shouting at the woman to let me go and threatening to call the guards and police if she did not. I heard the woman saying that I was her daughter and she wouldn't let me go. Looking back on it at this part, I laugh because I was a very pale white child and this woman was clearly darker skinned. I'm not sure how her argument could have made sense in her own head. After a lot of shouting, the woman unlocked the car and let me go. I assume because I was too much hassle. I was in tears and I ran away. I saw my mother and ran. My mother asked the woman what happened, and the woman flat out lied to my mother and my friend's mother, saying that she was told to pick me up from school by her friend, then got into her car and left. One of the worst parts about this is that my mother believed her, and to this day insists that this incident never happened, even though my friend and his mother remember it. So it couldn't be a dream. I don't know what would have happened to me, or who this woman was waiting for me after she locked me in her car, but I'm very grateful for my friend's mother, as I could owe her my life. 
An entity attached itself to me for a period of five years. It was not a real person, and I was not able to figure out who or what it was. This is the story. The first time I noticed him was when I had moved into my old apartment on the third and top floor. I had one huge bay window spanning the entirety of the apartment. It looked out onto Main Street, and there were bus stops across the street. For a few nights in a row, I noticed the same guy dressed in dark jeans and a dark hoodie, with his hood up, staring up at my window. He was standing just to the left of the bus stop, and I guessed, okay, the dude is just waiting for a bus. But then it kept happening, every night, during the day, on weekends. Weird things were happening in my apartment when I would notice him. Certain little electronics that would make sounds or songs would start to play. Eventually, I noticed him. Realized I needed something from my car, so I went down and peeked to see if he was there, but he was gone. So I go back upstairs, and he's back, just staring at me. I decide to test it out. I ran down the stairs outside, and he's gone again. I go back up, and he hasn't moved a muscle, as there isn't anywhere he could have just run off to and hidden. As it was a large and empty lot behind the bus stop, I was so freaked out, so I just kind of ignored it until I started seeing him everywhere I went. If I was at work, I'd see him in the parking lot. Gradually, he would get closer and closer to me. He would be in the front office at work or standing on the stairs, and eventually in the back seat of my car. I tried to ask questions or talk or get some kind of response. And nothing ever came of it. He came and went for a few years. I moved a few years after, and used to get friends hanging around, and always knew he was around because of a specific feeling I've got. Nothing malicious nor hurtful, but as soon as I got it, I knew he was going to show up somewhere. So in my new place one morning, I get up and jump to the shower. I get that feeling. Okay, no problem. I'm just rinsing off, and a hand that is not my own runs through my hair. Initially, my brain went, "It's my boyfriend," except we weren't living together yet. He wasn't over, and I freaked out and left the house immediately. There is nothing that can convince me that I did not feel someone running their hand through my hair on my scalp. I remember the feeling to this day. And it was as real as anything else in my life. I called my sister, who was into old-timey magic stuff, and she did a little protection thing for me. It took a few more years for him to taper off. He never got that close to me again, and occasionally, but rarely, will he show up now. I still have no idea who, or what, it was. It was last year, close to May, when I was feeling very, very anxious about an essay I had to give in a week from then, and as usual, as a way to prevent me from having an anxiety attack, I started reading a book on Wattpad. It was a mystery, suspense, and romance book, which I remember was so unusual from being what I normally read, and it captivated me. I read anywhere. I could read on the bus while waiting for the bus during class, taking a break. I even sometimes read while walking, and this book was so amazing that I couldn't put it down. Then it happened. On May twenty second, my class was scheduled to go to the annual national book exhibition, and I remembered that we had scheduled to meet for coffee with the entire class to show off which books we had brought. And discussed the seminar which we had to watch about script writing and book writing and the difference between them. But I didn't go to the seminar. I sneaked away to a photography gala a few roads ahead, and returned just in time for the coffee. There I was, so uninterested in the conversation that I continued reading my book, 
In 48 hours, I had already ploughed through 103 chapters and only had five more. I was sure I would finish by the time I was home, and I was right. I did finish and even reviewed it, and I had a lengthy conversation with the author too. A week later, I got a notification on my phone that the author updated the seventh chapter of the book, where they had finished. I thought it was a Wattpad glitch, but as I checked it from both my phone and the computer, there were only seven chapters and not 108. I then went immediately to my chat, and our conversation was gone. I asked her if she had deleted the chapters, and she said no, and then I proceeded to tell her what I had read. She freaked out and asked me how I knew things, and I told her that I'd read it all. She didn't believe me. Biggest. I still see notifications about new chapters of the story, and I'm a little bit creeped out. Was it a glitch? Did I see the future? Did my subconscious go that far? Nothing makes sense. I grew up having paranormal experiences take place around me, but I think the one that sticks out to me is a fairly recent one. Last year, my ex-boyfriend gave me a light string with rose-shaped decorations over the lights. I put it up on the wall next to my bed and used to leave them on all night before they stopped working as I'm afraid of the dark. Well, one day in mid-December around 11 p.m., I was lying in bed ready to go to sleep when I felt a weight shift at the foot of the bed. It was as if someone had just sat down. I sleep with my room completely closed and both my door and window shut and I hadn't heard my door open, so it couldn't have been one of my parents coming in to check on me. A few minutes later, I managed to gather up the courage and sat up in bed to take a look. The loose end of the fairy lights, the one that just dangled off the wall, looked like it had someone pulling it away from the wall, and then the person was just releasing it. On its own. I swear I almost crapped myself. I stared at it for a few seconds, my heart pounding out of my chest before I got my phone and turned on the flashlight and pointed it to it. As soon as I did that, it stopped. Needless to say, I did not get a good night's sleep after that. So, some time ago, I came home in our old family house. And when you walk into the front door, there was an armchair facing the TV. And to the left was a sofa. And my older brother was sat on the armchair. And I went to sit on the sofa. Brother's eye view was in my direction. And my mother was in the kitchen cooking. Next minute, I heard my sister's voice screaming my name from upstairs. Yang, come here. I replied, I just be up there in a minute. She screamed at me to come up now, and I replied to give me a minute. She kept on shouting, and so I walked upstairs, and there was no one there. I was extremely confused and walked downstairs and asked my brother where Kim was. He said he didn't know. I walked into the kitchen and asked my mum, and she said that she had gone into town. This strangest bit is that I asked my brother if he had heard me shouting at her, and he said no. I'm still baffled by what went on then. When I was seven years old, I was in kindergarten. My birthday is late in the year, so I couldn't apply when I was six like most kids, since it was through the school year. We had a teacher, Mr. H. But this isn't about him. It's about a substitute I had one day. I can't actually remember his name, as he was only there for one day. But Mr. H was amazing, very caring and good with kids. This substitute was not. He was generally very weird and quiet, and didn't talk to us much besides what was absolutely necessary, like the daily story time, etc. The issues arrived at story time. 
I was wearing a skirt with leggings under it. I was never feminine. Turns out I'm trans, which makes lots of sense, so I didn't cross my legs like a lady. Like my parents taught me. But hey, I was seven. So after story time, we had that free time period. Some kids painted, some just talked, some napped or ate snacks, and I was an avid reader, so I was reading as usual sitting in the corner. The substitute was sitting there too. Nobody else was in this corner. And the substitute turns to me and says very bluntly, Are you wearing panties? Because it doesn't look like you are. Keep in mind I didn't have my legs widespread, just not crossed. And had leggings on under my skirt. Also for the record I was. And at the time, I was being abused at home. So I honestly didn't think much of it. That sort of stuff was normal to me at the time, but I was a little bit put off. I decided to read elsewhere and got up to move to the other side of the classroom. The substitute teacher followed me throughout the entire block. The substitute followed me around the classroom, keeping his eye on me as I did various things like playing with the sand table, painting or reading. Every time we were doing anything complicated, like basic addition or spelling, He'd be hovering over me even though I didn't need help. He was also very touchy, constantly touching my shoulder, running his fingers through my hair amongst other things, although he never directly touched me inappropriately. But I was very uncomfortable with being touched at all due to what was happening at home. I ended up going home unscathed, and I honestly didn't even tell my parents. I didn't even realize it until years later when I was 11 and coping with the rest of my trauma, that I realized how really creepy that all was. A few years ago, I was just coming home from work, absolutely shattered from another grueling day at the office. My boss Janice had given me a mother load, and I was suffering for it, with deadlines approaching. Now I'm not sure what this experience was. Was it a product of my exhaustion or something more? As I'm walking up to my building, I grab my keys as I usually do, swipe the fob and open the door. The post boxes are on the left hand side. And as I go to my post box, I insert the key and flip. Inside there are a few parcels. I get them look through my mail, put them under my arm, and open the next door to make my way into the concourse of the elevators. It was there that I pushed the button, and I look to see where the elevator is currently at. Floor 12. Great. It'll be a minute before it comes down. So I start to absentmindedly look at my envelopes, opening my letters, and seeing what I had received. After I was reading this boring document sent from work, did I hear the familiar ding of the elevator? It arrives, and I look to see who's coming out of it. The thing is, it was me. I was wearing a completely different set of clothes. I looked like I was going to the gym. The other me didn't even notice me. He just walked right past me, opened the door and left. I was so taken aback that the elevator doors closed on me and they went up to an even higher floor and it took a while before it came back down. When it opened again, there was no one there. I was feeling incredibly confused. Was my mind playing tricks on me because I was so tired? Or was it something else? I got in the elevator, rode it all the way up, opened my apartment door, and everything was as it was. I still don't know what to make out of that day, but it's never happened before or since, and I'm glad to live without that fear. This happened very recently. I work night shift. I don't drive, but I live 15 minutes away from my place of work. I live next to a cemetery. Around here, they don't put lights or many power poles in cemeteries. 
so there are no street lights on most of my walk. The night was extremely quiet. All the town's shops were closed. There were no bars around, so the streets were deserted. I shared my phone location with my boyfriend and my best friend when I began walking, because I had a bad feeling. The darkness was cut by a few porch lights as I walked. My footsteps sounded like they were echoing. There were slightly offbeat sounds between my steps. I stopped and looked back quickly, but no one was there. I continued to walk and the sound started again. I looked back and it stopped. The lights from a porch illuminated a pair of feet behind a car on the street. I was three houses down from mine. I booked it. I never knew my tiny legs could run so fast. The steps were behind me. I threw my door open so fast, it hit my wall and I slammed it, locking both locks and flipping off all my lights and putting a chair underneath my doorknob. It didn't seem like anyone was behind me anymore, but this person knew where I lived. I sat on my floor quietly, crying, holding my hamster in my lap for a minute as I tried to calm myself. My home is a separate garage apartment outside a house. It's very quiet usually, and the only noise really being my hamster, and my hamster is asleep by 5am. I heard rustling around my house all night. At 5.30am, I heard a knock on my door. No voices or anything, just knocks and shuffling, and more rustling. My boyfriend came by to check on me that morning and my doormat was moved, but nothing else was too amiss. I didn't call the police, but there's good reason. The police are shared with multiple cities, so they don't usually come or show up late, just to not really assist. I wanted to go to bed and stay quiet. To the guy who followed me home, let's not meet again. This happened almost 15 years ago, when I was seven. My best friend's mum would babysit my brother and I before and after school. My mum would usually drop us off at her house at around 6am. She would make us breakfast, and then the three of us would walk to our elementary that was less than a 10 minute walk away. To preface, we would walk through an adjacent neighbourhood, through this small wooded area that had an enclosed bridge that led us to the back of our elementary. The elementary sits back in a long tree line that runs about a half mile north and another mile south. Anyway, we're about to get to the turn where we walk into the tree line to the bridge, and this guy comes cruising down the street. At first, I don't even think we noticed him considering how young we were. But right when he's about 10 feet away from us, he slows down to virtually zero miles per hour. There was nothing that stood out about his appearance either. He was middle aged and white and very generic looking. We all stare at the car and start walking super slowly. If we stop, he would stop. If we walk, he would slowly go. During this whole ordeal, he has a blank expression on his face. Not anger, no smirk, just this sinister deadness almost. This went on for about five minutes because we were too scared he'd jump out of the car if we turned our backs on him and I was mainly scared for my little brother. Finally, he speeds off and we run the rest of the way to school and immediately go to the principal's office. And this is the point which we are bawling. We gave them our version of the story, his descriptions, and whatever else a seven year old is actually capable of giving. They take action by calling the cops and our parents. The cops come and we explain where it happened in the story again. Then our parents ended up taking us out of school. From then on, we weren't allowed to walk to school anymore and our babysitter would take us. 
The reason this ended up being so creepy is because apparently there had been reports around the time of a guy who would sit under the bridge we walked over right by the school and watch people. They didn't know if he was homeless or if this was another guy who we encountered. They never caught him and we never saw him again. Whether this was a more sinister encounter than we thought or was he just bored? We will never know. I do know how bizarre it was though. Who stares at children that intently while driving by? He even turned his head around as he was driving. By his chance of luck, no other cars drove by during this whole ordeal. And I'd rather not meet him again. Fifteen years ago, my family and I went to a pre-Hispanic ruin at night to watch an announced planet's alignment. We went there because it's a rural place and a one hour trip from a major city and there are no lights to bother you so you can star watch. Once there at about 10 PM, we tried looking for the planetary alignment, but no one knew how to identify any planet. So we just watched a pretty starred night with two of my cousins deciding to follow up a hill trail to see what was behind it in search of the unknown or perhaps something paranormal. We walked for about 20 minutes and found a house with dogs. They began barking at us and we decided to return. That's all my cousin and I remember for the trek. Meanwhile, the rest of my family had a really strange experience. When they lost sight of us from the distance, they saw a light that moves towards them really slowly without sound, but with strong winds at ground level to move with it. When the lights reached above them, my mother and my aunt screamed and everybody sheltered in their cars. They wanted to leave, but my cousins and I were still missing. Then the light kept moving and was lost over the hill that they were trekking. My dad, my brother and my other cousin went up the hill searching for us, but couldn't find us. They waited a long time and then again went up the hill for us. They said they also reached the house with the dogs, but couldn't find us. They came back, waited, and were very worried. Then we came down as if nothing happened. I remember my family were really worried and asked us why we took so long. And then we just got into the cars and left as quickly as we could. I didn't know anything about why they were worried and didn't ask. Some years later, my mother and my aunt told me the story, asking me why we took so long and if we saw the light. Just then I realized that the trekking for my cousin and I was about 20 minutes at best, but for my family, it was two hours or more. Last year, my girlfriend and I went up a bike trip through the trail and I was expecting to see the house, but I couldn't find it. I'm planning a new trip there to see if I can reach the lake. It certainly weirded all of us out. So back in seventh grade, I started studying Latin. And for some reason, it was always a big deal in my family and caused a running joke. I think I might have said something nerdy once and that got the whole family's attention. Anyway, one Easter shortly after, I get a usual gift basket filled with mostly delicious goodies and knickknacks. This was back in Germany, so slightly different customs. And one of the gifts was an Asterix and Obelix book. Some people might not know what it is, but it's just a popular comic of Celts fighting Romans. German comics, y'all. And this book was written entirely in Latin. Firstly, I'm excited because I get a chance to put my Latin to the test. However, I quickly realize it's way out of my reading range and thus I just put it to the side. No further thoughts given. The next day I decide to try and give it another shot and I actually prepare with my Latin book and notes from class. But when I open the book, it's all in German. I flip through the pages trying to find where the Latin begins, but every last word is German. For a few minutes, I skeptically stare at this book, trying to figure out what's happening. And after a while, my brain gets frustrated and concludes that I was probably just tired yesterday and somehow associated the Romans in the book with Latin 
because there's no way that my rational brain would allow me to believe in language shifting books. Annoyed, I tossed the book aside and don't think about it again. The very next day, I'm not even thinking about the book that made me actually consider the existence of dark magic. Only after a long while of chilling in my room, do I notice out of the corner of my eye the stupid title of the stupid book written in Latin. I'm not as shocked as I am angry, because this stuff doesn't happen. I flip through the pages, and actually jump in the air out of frustration when I find that it is all written in Latin. I go ballistic. I turn the book upside down, read it backwards, take it to another room and hold it up close to the light. But this is still Latin. It goes on for a few days switching languages from Latin to German. It also decided to get more ballsy, not even waiting until the next day to execute the shift. I myself grow increasingly angry, running up to where the book was to check the language it was currently on as soon as I get home. I also can't tell anyone about this, because of what I'm going to say. Hey, can you check this book for me? I think it's magic. Could you imagine the ridicule? I eventually grew so upset with the book that my main fear was of the possibility that it would not switch languages because then it would definitely indicate me having gone mad and it was almost some sort of comfort to see a change. Only after one day do I accidentally let my book slip behind my bed and I leave it there and then do I finally get to the bottom of this. My mum had actually brought both the Latin and German versions of the books and switch them out whenever I wasn't looking. I told you my overachieving Latin studying was the source of running family jokes, and my mum took this to a whole nother level. She never mentioned anything once. I'd figured it out just to not give them the satisfaction, but it sure freaked me the hell out while that was happening. I work the night shift at a hotel, so I've had tons of weirdos come through, but this is the most recent. Everything started off normally. Usually once I click in at 11pm, I can just sit at the desk and only see a few people. I'm a loner, and I prefer it this way. At 2.30 in the morning, a guy in his 30s comes down and stands in front of me at the desk. I've worked this job for five years, so I can pick out the weirdos pretty well, and I knew right away something was off about him. He didn't say anything at first, just stared at me, so I asked, can I help you? He mumbles something. All that I can make out is the word coffee. I tell him that there's fresh coffee available in the breakfast area behind him. He turns, then looks back at me confused. Do you have some coffee I can take to my room? My first thought is that this guy is drunk as hell. And I told him he could take a cup of the already made coffee, or I could give him a few packs to take. He wanted the packs, so I grabbed a few and handed them to him, hoping that that's all he wanted and I could resume watching TV. No such luck. He kept standing in front of me looking at the packets of coffee, confused. I'd had enough of drunk guy, so I walk over to the other side of the desk and stare at the TV, ignoring him. After a few minutes, he wandered into the breakfast area and stares at the pots of coffee. Then he wanders over to the fruit, the cereal, yogurt, and back. He's just staring at everything and walking in slow circles. After a while of that, he stops looking at the food and looks at the ground, then starts muttering to himself as he walks in circles. Now he is officially freaking me out. He's at least six inches taller than me and 50 pounds heavier, and I'm the only one on shift. I start thinking of escape options, like locking myself in the laundry room, running to the gas station next door, as I've had to do it a few times where things have gotten really bad. So I try to plan ahead when people give me bad vibes. About 15 minutes after, he starts walking in circles and he heads down the hall, still muttering. I relax, happy he's gone to bed to pass out 
and I'll have the lobby to myself again. Probably five minutes later, I glance out the front doors, and he's right there staring at me, smoking a cigarette, and talking to himself. I'm starting to think he's high, and that scares me enough to grab a pair of scissors when he's not looking, and hold them by my side. I begin contemplating calling the police, but what for? He hasn't done anything yet. So I wait it out, in the hopes that he goes to bed soon, since it was after 3am. For the next half hour, he walks up and down the hall, through the lobby, and outside, then comes back in through the back door and loops around again. The third time he walks by me, still talking, I was terrified, and was on the verge of saying, screw it. I'm calling 911 anyway, just to have someone else there with me. Just then an old woman walks up to the desk, and asks me to call her a cab. She has no idea how happy I am to see her. I call for her, and start chatting her up, which is very unusual for me, just to keep her in the lobby. The weirdo comes around the corner for the fourth time, and the old woman tells him to pack his stuff. They're leaving, because he woke her up and she couldn't go back to sleep. Apparently this old lady is the weird guy's mum, and I feel much better knowing he was going to leave as soon as the cab got there. As soon as she told him to pack his stuff, he got angry. He didn't want to leave, he told her to go back to bed, but she was adamant, and after they argued for a bit, which was awkward for me just sitting there watching, he goes upstairs to pack. She explained to me that she could tell he was getting agitated, and that it was time to take him home. I spoke to her for a while, and she opened up to me that her son is schizophrenic, and she's the only one who can take care of him. She told me she just wished someone would take him for just six months, like a hospital, to get him on meds and into a good routine. I felt so awful for her. She seemed so tired and hopeless. I have mental issues myself, so I could relate to the struggle. All of a sudden the weird guy comes running out demanding to stay, and they argue again. Except this time he sees me watching and focuses on me, storming up to the desk and screaming. She's gonna call the cops, I didn't do anything. Loads of horrible things followed. I just stood there stunned. I held the scissors up to defend myself, and his mum screamed, stop. Do you hear what you're saying to her? And he calmed down just as fast as he snapped. The cab pulled up, and as much as I felt for his mum, I was happy to see them pull away. I'd rather not meet him, ever, again. Ten years ago, I was returning home from a road trip with two friends. I received a phone call from my parents asking when we would be arriving, and I explained that we were around 25 minutes away. About a minute later, we come around a bend. It was a full moon, and we could see the reflection from the lake below us, and other than the road, it was completely empty. Suddenly everything went completely dark in the car. No lights, no dash or gauges or headlights on the road. The music also stopped, and we started at the beginning of the CD we were listening to. There was now a vehicle pulled over by the police a quarter of a mile in front of us, that hadn't been there a split second before. I assumed I had dozed off for just a second, as it was late. I thought it was still quite peculiar. After about a minute, the driver of the car turns the music all the way down and said, Did that just happen to anyone else? The other passenger, in the back seat, sat forward abruptly and exclaimed, I thought I just fell asleep. Then we realised that the clock in the car was reading an hour later than it had just a minute before. To keep ourselves from freaking out, we decided the car had possibly had a momentary electrical failure, and reset the clock to an old time. We turned off the dash lights, headlights and gauges, restarted the CD player, but when we arrived home 25 minutes later, we were an hour late. I'm missing an hour of my life, and to this day, I have no idea what happened. 
When I was around eight, during recess at school, I noticed a bunch of other kids outside a storage room, yelling and warning others not to approach because there was an eyeball staring back at you. I was curious because I didn't understand what they meant, but I could see their fear was real because their faces were pale white and they would try to deter me from taking a peek through the keyhole. I remember bending down slightly so that I could get a closer look inside, and sure enough there was an eyeball staring back at me, and it freaked me out so much I peed my pants on the spot. It was only later that day that I had ended up in the nurse's office because of the commotion us kids had created, that the janitor had to go into the room to inspect this whole mess. Turns out that someone had placed a mirror against that door, and the eyeballs we were seeing were our own reflections. When we first moved into the house I grew up in, I used to hear things calling my name from the opposite end of the house. Let's say I'd be in my room playing with Lego or something, and I would hear my dad calling my name from his room. So I'd go to my parents' bedroom and ask them what they wanted, and they'd always tell me that they'd never called my name. Being a little kid, I honestly started to think that they were playing a joke on me because this happened about once every few days. Well, one night, it happened, and I went to ask them what they wanted. But right as I stepped into their room, I heard my mother's voice calling me from the living room, which is all the way on the other side of the house. It was at that exact point that I knew no one was tricking me, because I was looking at both of my parents sitting in front of me. I kind of kept this to myself, until my brother was diagnosed with partial narcolepsy. One of the symptoms of narcolepsy is apparently oral hallucinations, so I thought maybe it had to be that. I went and got myself checked, and I was completely fine. I have no idea what was calling my name all those years ago, and I still hear it at night, whenever I come over to stay. I used to walk some trails in a small park in my city. I was a 15 or 16 year old girl who loved the peace and quiet of the woods as opposed to the heckling of the street. One day I go into my usual time after school at around 3pm or so. I wander my usual route and I should add it's not possible to get lost because these woods aren't very large. I notice it's getting dark quite quickly almost out of nowhere, and suddenly I get a call from my mum, who is flipping out and demanding to know where I am. She says that she's been calling me for an hour. I tell her I never received any calls, and I've been walking like I always do. She tells me that I've been gone for three hours, but I'm never gone for more than one. I check my phone and sure enough, it says six. Somehow I lost two hours of my life in those woods and I have no idea how or why. It felt like an hour to me. My mum's calls also never showed on my log, even though I should never lose service in there. 